The Lord be with you. The weekend of Advent Sunday, on the cusp of a new church year, what does one say simultaneously to the diocesan synod of Cashel, Ferns and Ossery, virtually assembled online, and to the wider diocese um, via our online platforms this particular special weekend? I've always loved Advent. I suppose there's a certain sentimentality of association and expectation about it. One delights in the traditional practices like the lighting of the successive candles on the wreath as we get nearer to the celebration of the true light of Christmas. These things, certainly this particular weekend, we're going to feel rather robbed of. And Advent is going to be a good deal more austere, but then perhaps that's in the true nature of it. But before I go any further, both in the context of the Synod and speaking more generally to the diocese, I want to read one of the Gospel readings associated with today from Mark 13, which is the so-called apocalyptic chapter of uh, Mark's Gospel about Christ's coming, about the end time, about things which are frankly frightening and which are put into metaphors and images which tend normally to elude us in many ways. This year perhaps they'll wash over us less than they might normally do. But says Jesus, in those days after that suffering the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or at cockcrow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. What I say I, to you, I say to all, keep awake. Well, perhaps a good maxim at the beginning of a synod. But... As all through the many years of my life, I've listened to the sort of language of Advent coming and drama and judgment and all the consequences, consequence stresses and anxieties and turbulence. In a way, the language all washed over me. I never thought I'd actually experience a period in my life when that sort of language became much more appropriate, leaving the realms of poetry almost to become the realms of actuality. And I'm not suggesting that the present turbulence, the present pestilence is something directly visited on us by God, far from it. But certainly our experience of facing mortality, of in a sense, being so aware of our frailty, of not knowing what's round the corner, of being met with a bolt from the blue that has transformed us in a way we would never have dreamed envisageable when we were facing into Advent a year ago. In a curious way, all this has made Advent language at last rather more real and realistic for us, and perhaps in a small way we should be thankful for that. And just to say three things about how it has been of value, certainly to me, to find an Advent language more immediate. First of all, Advent is all about crisis, about judgment, about something breaking in that is shocking. 
And it is at the moments of crisis and of test that has anciently been said that we know then what our faith is worth. And I think an awful lot of us have discovered a testing experience recently of what our faith is worth. Is it worth contributing, to be uh, straightforward about it, to the work of a church which has been unable in many ways to function in its usual public way and has to find new imaginative and pastoral ways of doing so? We have proved the worth of our faith and worship by the extraordinary uh, imagination, energy, resilience, creativity with which we have transferred things online, with which we've reconnected with people in new ways, with which pastoral mission has never ceased. But certainly, these weeks, as we go also into Advent, they have been proof of the truth that when the test comes, you know what your faith is worth. Secondly, We've often talked a lot in the Church of Ireland about being over-dependent on buildings. It's a kind of love-hate relationship that we have with them. We keep saying we all know we're far too many, that they drag us down, that they cost too much, but we love them all and we wouldn't want to be rid of any of them. And so we are forever caught in the building's preoccupation and dilemma. This particular experience has, whether we like it or not, gave us a trial run and an instructive experience in how we, as it were, do without the great buildings. Years ago, when I was Dean of the Cathedral in Cork, I had a curate called Andrew McCroskery, wonderful preacher. He's now uh, an incumbent in Dublin. And I remember him preaching a sermon at the beginning of Advent, which nearly shook the congregation, not least because it was delivered in so quiet a manner. He talked about the history of St Finbar's Cathedral, the solidity of the cathedral dominating the city. And that cathedral, interestingly enough, was built in, completed in 1870 and consecrated just a few uh, weeks before the cataclysm of disestablishment. And it was almost a message in stone and architecture to the city and to the Church of Ireland. We haven't gone away. We will be here for a very long time. And Andrew reflected upon this history and he suddenly said to the congregation, like the great buildings of the ancient world, this building one day will fall down. And it still haunts me that devastating insight that one day the greatest of buildings will fall down, the faith will go on, and from time to time in Christian history we're driven out of buildings or learn how to operate without buildings. And this has been a marvellously creative time of realising that buildings are not essential to sacramental worship, to pastoral care, to Christian discipleship, to the experience of God, important as they are and will continue to be. I don't think we'll ever see them in quite the same way. And the last thing I might say that is truly Adventy is this. When I was a curate, I remember my first rector telling me rather wistfully he always preached in Advent when he was young on the last things, death, judgment, heaven and hell. But he'd found it increasingly hard to make them connect with the reality of life. And I've found it hard to each Advent to talk about the last things in the run up to Christmas when everybody is concerned with shopping and consumerism. And in some ways, Advent is normally a big demonstration that we all live in the fickle power of the market. But this particular year, we've a new sense of the last things. Certainly, we hope that a vaccine is coming, that better times are ahead. But never as of late have we been so re-reminded of the frailty of human nature. We are living again in the midst of mortality. We think of the situation in our nursing homes. We think of how young people have been struck down by COVID, how the lingering effects of it have been far more perhaps dramatic than even we know yet. We listen to the stories of those on the front line. We look at the television pictures of overcrowded hospitals. We realise all the measures we've had to take to try to avoid that situation. Never in a long time, possibly in a century, have we been so aware of, in a way, the last thing in this human life that is the reality of mortality 
and it's no harm occasionally to know anew that we are fearfully and wonderfully made and that in the midst of life we are in death and to whom can we turn for help but only to a merciful God and it is a truth that it is often pestilence, war and test that somehow has strengthened faith in the long term even when we are terrified it has weakened the economies and the essential structures and the operating fabric of the church almost beyond measure and yet somehow faith comes out the better leaner and more authentic enough about thoughts of advent to the synod one might say this is a unique occasion. One hopes there won't be online synods needed in the future, although we'll have learned to have many online and hybrid meetings. But people will look back at this synod as a historic event and they'll wonder what it was like. And uh, perhaps let's hope that they realise that in the spirit of Advent and in the spirit of the times, this synod has an urgency about it. We do our business and we make our decisions effi efficiently, and we have done with waffle and humbug. And to the wider diocese, we look ahead with hope. Christmas is coming, although it will be different. A vaccine may well be on the horizon. But as we approach crib Christmas and contemplate the crib and bring ourselves alongside the crib figures uh, towards the manger throne, Remember this, and it's something I noticed, and it's always been a feature of cribs, and I never noticed it till this year, that the traditional way we put the key figures in the crib involves social distancing. Figures uh, are never on top of each other. They all are in their own space, and they're all challenged to respond to Christ themselves without others doing the singing and the reveling and the caroling for them. This Christmas in the intimacy and perhaps austerity to some extent of it, may it be a season to respond to Christ individually, like the socially distanced cribs figures, and not depending on others, apart from the angels, to make the music for us. I want to finish with the Advent Collect, which has summed up comfortingly this season for centuries. Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put on the armour of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to us in great humility, that on the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Two verses finally of the most seasonal of Advent hymns. O come, O come, Emmanuel, praying for wisdom for the synod, praying for the dispersion of gloom for us all. Perhaps best sung, not by a big choir, but by a plaintive voice in the distance. O come, thou wisdom from above, who orderest all things through thy love, to us the path of knowledge show, and teach us in her ways to go. O come, thou dayspring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. <laughs>